Hello there. Thanks for watching this video. This is the first video in the second multi-part series on this channel. If you end up enjoying this, make sure to like, comment, subscribe, and turn on notifications so that the great algorithmical DM of YouTube recognizes my content. If you'd like to support me further than that, I've got a Patreon where you can support my content for as little as one gold piece per month. Alternatively, if you'd like to pick up a shirt or sticker, head on over to cnp-productions.com slash store, where I add new designs each week to correspond with that week's video. The shirts come in sizes from extra small to 2XL, and the stickers come in 3, 4, and 5.5 and inch sizes. Designs are added several days before the video goes live, so check in regularly to see what's out there. I suggest navy blue shirts, but that's just my taste. Anyway, thank you for watching, and let's get into it. For nearly as long as civilization has existed, people have found ways to relax after a long day's work. Games are nearly as old as invention itself. If the evidence is to be believed, the oldest game that we know of is a variation of the modern Moncala game. The end goal of this game is to capture enough of the opponent's pieces and claim enough of the board so that the opponent cannot take any more moves. In essence, like chess, this is a war game. War games have come in a large range of styles, sizes, and goals, but they are all made to take the essence of combat and the idea of one person or group fighting another and turn it into a mental sport of sorts. Games like Mancala have been played since at least as far back as 6000 BC, and its distribution across the world is most likely linked to the migration patterns of tribes and civilizations. As we fast forward to 1913, the book Little Wars, written by one of the fathers of modern science fiction, the English novelist, journalist, sociologist, and historian H.G. Wells, most well known for his books The Time Machine and The War of Worlds, is written as a manual for playing a game of military encounters, battles, and even full-scale wars using a series of miniature models of different kinds of military units and divisions. Wells was an outspoken pacifist, however, he did most certainly enjoy playing his fair share of war games. In fact, according to Wells, the idea of the game was developed from a visit by his friend Jerome K. Jerome. After dinner, Jerome began shooting down toy soldiers with a toy cannon, and Wells joined in to compete. The two decided that, with the addition of written rules, a good Kriegspiel-type game could be developed. For reference, Kriegspiel is a type of game invented by the Prussian military in the 19th century as a way of teaching battlefield tactics to new officers. Wells's game revolved around the use of lead holocast soldiers made by W. Britton, a die-cast toy company, and battlefield made of whatever materials were on hand. Usually, they were blocks or other types of toys. The simple rules of movement, firing, and close combat were developed with a set amount of time for each player to move and fire. Wells also provided a chapter of, quote, extensions and amplifications of Little War. In an appendix, Wells provided Little Wars and Kriegspiel, which were more complex rules to be played in a larger space involving military logistics, engineers, cavalry charges, and transporting troops using railway systems. I personally suggest that uh, anyone interested in the rules of Wells's game go and read it for yourselves. Various versions can be found at Project Gutenberg, alongside Wells's previous game book, Floor Games, and a special edition with a foreword by Gary Gygax was published in 2004 by Skirmisher Publishing. These games, their history, and their culture would give life to possibly the most important game ever created, but it would certainly take a while for it to get where it needed to be.
Ernest Gary Gygax was born in 1938 to his father, an ex-Chicago Symphony Orchestra violinist named Ernst Gygax, and his mother, Almina Emily. While named after his father, he more regularly went with his middle name, taken by his mother from actor Gary Cooper. At seven years old, his family moved back to the family home in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin, where his mother's family had settled in the early 19th century, and Gary's grandparents still lived. During these formative years, he became friends with future business partner Don Kay, and the two would develop a love for games, as well as science fiction and fantasy literature from authors like Wells and Tolkien. As a child, Gygax would play games like Pinochet and chess. Around 10 years old, he and his friends would create and play their own games of make-believe that would eventually inspire what is today live-action roleplay, where one person would act as a referee to settle action disputes. By the early 50s, he and Kay had taken their passion for games and their appreciation of history to miniature wargaming. As teenagers, the two would create their own rule systems inspired by Wells' Little Wars, and would use a series of 50mm and 70mm figures alongside small firecrackers for explosions. By that time, he had an appetite for pulp fiction authors such as Lovecraft, Vance, Howard, Lieber, and Burroughs, and would take that inspiration into his various war games with friends. Now, outside of games, however, Gygax was a rather mediocre student, and would end up dropping out of high school a few months after his father had passed away. While he had attempted to join the US military, specifically the Marines, he was diagnosed with walking pneumonia, and was given a medical discharge, where he moved back in with his mother, and would commute to Chicago to work for Kemper Insurance Company. Around that same time, he was introduced to the newest war game by Avalon Hill, called Gettysburg, and would become absolutely obsessed with it, often playing marathon sessions several times per week. He would eventually order blank hex maps from Avalon Hill to begin to create his own war games. At the same time, he was reintroduced to Mary Jo Powell, a friend of his who had left Lake Geneva during childhood. Now, he was absolutely smitten, and after a very short courtship, the two would marry, despite the fact that he was only 19 years old. They would end up moving to Chicago, where Gygax would continue to work for Kemper Insurance while taking anthropology classes at the University of Chicago. Now, even with all of his responsibilities to his wife, his now two children, his work, his school, and his political volunteerism, he would still find plenty of time to continue his obsession with war games. In 1962, he would move his family back to Lake Geneva and would work as an insurance underwriter for the Fireman's Fund Insurance Company. By 1967, he would co-found the International Federation of War Gamers, or the IFW, alongside Bill Spear and Scott Duncan, growing rapidly, mostly by assimilating a multitude of pre-existing wargaming clubs. He would promote wargaming of all types, eras, and genres. This would provide a sort of forum for wargamers to share rules with each other. That same year, he would host a 20-person game in the basement of his home, later referred to as Gen Con Zero. The following year, he would host his first official convention at the Lake Geneva Horticultural Hall, which he would rent out for $50. This Geneva convention, very cleverly named, would eventually evolve into today's Gen Con gaming convention, the largest tabletop and RPG gaming convention in North America. In 1969, at Gen Con 2, Gygax would meet Dave Arnes, the man who would eventually be sort of the Bill Fingers of Gygax's Bob Kane. In late 1970, Gygax would be laid off from FFI and would begin cobbling shoes, which would give him a steady income for his family of five children, while also allowing him more time to develop his own war games. In 1971, he would produce and edit Alexander the Great and Dunkirk the Battle of France for Guide on Games. At the same time, he would write a medieval era war game with friend and hobby shop owner Jeff Perrin called Chainmail. 
Though originally published for the fanzine The Domesday Book, Guide on Games would bring him on full-time to write a more fleshed-out version, including rules for a fantasy supplement that included heroes, superheroes, and wizards. These rules and races would be largely derived from Tolkien and contemporary sources, and often would directly rip names or descriptions right from the works. Chainmail would be a major success for such a small publisher, averaging 100 copies sold per month. The system would not only have rules for mass combat, wherein each figure counted as 20 units and were divided into multiple classes with different advantages and disadvantages, but also man-to-man -man combat, wherein the success of an attack depended on the types of weapons used and the armor levels of the combatants, and two six-sided die would determine whether a kill was made. Gygax's fantasy supplement, as he told Wargamer's newsletter, would add, quote, rules for Tolkien fantasy games, including rules for creatures such as Balrogs, Hobbits, Trolls, Giants, and, perhaps most importantly, Dragons. The first edition supplement would also add conceptual basics for elementals and magical swords, alongside foundational spells for his later works, Fireball and Lightning Bolt, among others. This would also establish the idea of making saving throws and outclassing magic casters with stronger casters based on rolling certain die to prevent or minimize their effects. Your dungeon master has placed you in a dreadfully precarious position. You're playing the most phenomenal game ever created. Your skin grows cold from your first glimpse of the enormous beast. It's a product of your imagination. Survival depends on a quick, decisive move. Your choices are limited. Stand and fight, or run. Use your lightning bolt. Victory is yours. Win the treasure. TSR Hobbies. Dungeons and Dragons games. Products of your imagination. In 1972, Dave Arneson and his friend David McGarry, the inventor of the Dungeon board game, would travel back to Lake Geneva to showcase their respective games to Gygax, who represented Gaidon Games. Adapting and adding rules to Gygax's chainmail, Arneson had created a game that placed you in the shoes of an individual soldier, whose story you would craft through their experiences and adventures with their companions, and would have a continuous canon of storytelling that carried over from session to session. The game took place in the medieval town of Blackmoor, specifically in the vast, sprawling dungeons under Castle Blackmoor, and had captivated Gygax from the moment he began playing it. After a tutorial game hosted in Gygax's basement, Gygax and Arneson would routinely write letters back and forth detailing the adventures had in their respective campaigns, and Gygax would create his own setting, Greyhawk, which would grow from a home game played with his son and daughter, Ernie and Elise, alongside his business partner Don Kay and their friends Robert and Terry Kuntz, to a group of around 24 players, with Rob eventually becoming a co-dungeon master so that the two only had to referee for a dozen players apiece. Gygax and Arneson would trade notes back and forth for months, creating what they called at the time, quote, the fantasy game. In fact, only two weeks after the initial tutorial, Gygax had come up with a 50-page rough draft of rules that he would send to his wargaming contacts, as well as Arneson, whose feedback would carry Gygax to continue to revise them. In 1973, though the final draft had not been vetted by Arneson, Gary Gygax would petition Guide on Games to publish this 150-page, three-book box set of rules as a game of its own, but would continue to find rejections as the project was too large for such a small publisher. Gygax would eventually have enough of it, and leaving in mid-October of 1973, alongside partner Don Kay, as well as business partner Brian Bloom, who became an equal one-third share partner for his $2,000 investment, would found Tactical Studies Rules, or more commonly known as TSR.
The first commercially available version of Dungeons and Dragons was released by TSR in 1974 as a box set of three books. The hand-assembled initial print run of the first 1,000 copies sold out in less than one year. The future looked bright for Gygax and K, but after K's unexpected death due to a heart attack in 1975, his entire estate, including his shares in TSR, would go to his wife, who had absolutely no desire to have anything to do with TSR in literally any capacity. After a reluctant acceptance by Gygax, Brian Bloom's father, Melvin, would buy out the remaining shares from Kay's wife, effectively turning Gygax into an employee at his own company. Arneson would be brought in to write Blackmore as an official supplement to D&D, after Gygax's Greyhawk, which might very well speak to the ongoing creative differences between Gygax and Arnison. Gygax would also go on to write Eldritch Wizardry and Swords and Spells for the original game. In 1976, TSR would move out of Gygax's basement and into their first official home known as the Dungeon Hobby Shop. The original box set, known today as the White Box, with its seven different print releases, would run through 1979, being slowly pushed out by the Dungeons & Dragons basic set, a more refined and simplified version of the game, released in 1977, until eventually it was entirely replaced. Alright, well that's pretty much all the time we have for today. Compressing that massive period of time as much as I could, I believe I've done a good job in still chronicling the first chapters of the story of the world's greatest game. Thank you so much for watching, there was a ton of research that went into this, and I appreciate all the time you've taken to listen to me talk about it. If you're still here and you have enjoyed the video, please like, comment, and subscribe, as well as turn on the notifications so that the great algorithmical dungeon master that is YouTube recognizes the dice that I'm rolling over here. If you'd like to support me, consider heading over to my Patreon, where you can support me for as little as one gold piece per month. If you'd like a comfortable, well-made t-shirt or high-quality sticker to represent the channel and my work, head on over to cnp-productions.com store, where we have shirts from extra small to 2XL and stickers in 3, 4, and 5.5 and inch sizes. I update the store weekly, with new designs usually being up three to four days before the video goes live, so check back regularly for new items. Once again, thank you very much for watching, and I will see you again next time with the second part of this great chronicle, same bat time, same bat channel.